Welcome to the stage, Nicholas Fairley. How do I serve the tribe? What can I do? What's the next thing I can do? Most unselfish thing a person can do is expand. No other option besides hard work. How they can live this three-dimensional lifestyle. YouTube, what's up? Are you an alpha male or are you a beta male? You being here watching this video kind of already shows me, but in this episode, you're going to actually find out what it looks like to be a beta or an alpha and how to do it the right way, not this toxic masculinity or is it even toxic at all. You have to see at the very end my epic guest say. Before that, if you have not checked out our virtual event that we're having, we're talking roadmap to six figures. If you're a businessman, that wants to scale his business past six figures without taking years and years and years and investment after investment after investment to be able to get there, we're hosting a workshop that's roadmap to six figures, breaking down the different things inside of a business, five things that produce profit in a business that the ones that fail do not do, that you can do and implement inside this workshop. Go to nicholasfairley.com slash event. Go apply, see if you're a good fit. We'll be in contact. And we'll see you at that event. So inside of this episode, if you have not gone and subscribed on YouTube as well, make sure to hit that subscribe button and also ring that little notification bell if you want more episodes just like this. My guest today, phenomenal, super polarizing. This guy was a strong man, is a strength coach, has been a father to over 2 million subscribers on YouTube, has hundreds of thousands of people that follow him on every single social media platform. And this dude is helping men become strong since 2007. Welcome my friend, Elliot Hulse. Elliot, welcome to the BDB podcast, man. Thanks for having me. 100%. Dude, I, I legitimately have tried to even mimic your voice. You've been very consistent in many ways, yet one of them has been for your men to actually DM you on Instagram. I remember I started following you and I was like, uh, swipe up or DM me the word king, message me the word king. And it got to the point where literally I was go driving in my car with my wife and my son. And I'm like, message me the word king. Let me know if you qualify to join us on the inside. And I was like, I got to get this guy on. He's influenced me in some way. So it's been <laughs> awesome seeing not only, I, I didn't know you when you were just doing your strong men content, your YouTube content, but I specifically found you on Instagram. Just want to say I appreciate it. And it's been awesome seeing your consistency. And not only that, the unwavering confidence you have in your message. Well, thank you. Totally, dude. So going into that kind of specific topic, there's a, obviously for our, our businessmen out there, there's the side that I want to jump into around your actual message with masculinity and raising up strong men. Cause I feel that we've kind of lost the definition of even what it means to be a man yet. Also on this side, like you must get a lot of hate. People go check out your Instagram, Elliot Hulse, go check it out. Uh, they can see right away that you have a polarizing message and every good message should be polarizing. Cause if you don't stand for anything, you fall for everything. Yet, how has that been being able to get your voice out there with a polarizing message that you obviously believe in, but also the backlash of you have to be getting messages of people that are upset with the way that you believe and you think? What's been the balance of that? How have you done it? Well, I cut my teeth on YouTube. I started making YouTube videos when YouTube first came out in 2007. And back then, there was no such thing as, like, at least I didn't know about being a YouTube celebrity. I was using it as a marketing tool to get men into my strength camps. And uh, over time, I began to recognize that there was a, uh, a large amount of people watching worldwide. And so my popularity skyrocketed pretty quickly when I got to over a million subscribers in 2013. Uh, I was popular because I was saying popular things. I was saying things that people like to hear. I was very motivational and educational. But I also, with that, with that popularity, started to become uh, very eccentric. Uh, I'm eccentric by nature, um, but I kind of hid it for a while. I was just giving people what they wanted. And as my popularity went up and I started just saying more of what I'm actually thinking, doing things that are a little off the wall, uh, the hate started coming in. So I went from being like, the golden child, like I, I would have videos with, you know, 30, 40,000 views and zero dislikes to, you know, almost, almost overnight when I started speaking up a little bit more, uh, the hate came down, uh, pretty hard and it affected me. I wasn't used to it. I wasn't prepared for it. 
And honestly, I didn't know what to do with it. And so that was like back in 2015, 16, 17. And I, I allowed it to affect me. I allowed it to kind of crush me. And I learned a lot of lessons as a result. And I'm happy that I had it during that time, given the, the type of content that I was offering, because later on, you know, now, today, my message has gotten even more polarizing and, my, and I've become even more eccentric. And because of the early experience, uh, I'm, I'm much more prepared for handling it. I almost feel like God gave me that first test to see if I was if I was tough enough to handle it. And quite frankly, I wasn't, but it gave me the strength to now be absolutely firm in my conviction and even embrace the hate. All these new hard things that we go through from the hundreds of people that I've interviewed, I've realized that most of them don't have less problems. Like you don't have less problems than me or other people that are listening right now. <laughs> Typically you have more problems and usually bigger ones it's just you flex the muscles so much that the smaller ones or, or whatever they are aren't as crazy as they used to be. I'm sure mm -hmm. that hate at first when you got that first, you know, comment below that said like, you're freaking sell, you're not like whatever it was, all of a sudden now probably doesn't hurt the same. And so you, you, you've you shown me even in that message that you've gotten stronger through going through the resistance, which is probably what you taught before in the past. Tell me the difference of the messages. You said you went from saying everything that people liked. What made you actually change it? Was it for you? You're like, I'm sick and tired of not saying what I believe. And what was the change of message? What did you start saying that all of a sudden people started hating? So I kind of get a, a an overview of exactly what that transition was like. Well, I'm a strength coach. And so uh, the videos that I would put up were strength coach, strength and fitness, powerlifting, strongman, bodybuilding related. Um, and when I started exploring a form of psychology, body psychology, through the work of Wilhelm Reich uh, and Alexander Lowen, I began to see how the body, you know, we're using the body as a tool for workouts and for sports, but the body is also a mirror reflection of what's happening psychologically. Uh, Wilhelm Reich coined a term uh, which was character structure, and he began to show how uh, the traumas that we have coming up in our life sort of affects the way we breathe and the body's a breathing mechanism. So the body will start to take on the, the form of the, of the predominant breathing pattern. And it's, that's sort of, uh, it, it's like a new thing, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, how would you say like, you know, uh, obscure fringe, it's a fringe idea. So I started blending body psychology with with my workout uh, stuff, and people didn't get it. Now people get it. It's a lot more. It's more prevalent now. People talk about the stuff that I was talking about. I'm usually a little bit ahead of my time, so I was talking about things that people just didn't understand or accept ten years ago, and as a result, you know, people were uh, you know they had a hard time and they were you know giving me beef about it. Um, so it wasn't even like it was, it wasn't, it wasn't nearly as, uh, how you would say, um, harsh as some of the th things I have to say today. It, even what you're saying that one of my mentors, Russell Brunson talks about that you never want to be the first one into something unless you're okay with getting arrows in your back. Right. Cause generally it's the, it's the person that came to America first that they got arrows in their back. Now we just live in America and we enjoy it and it's great. And you obviously don't want to be late to something in a marketplace where you're just saying what everyone else is saying and, and you end up just being kosher all the time, following the curve. And so I think it was cool that you went out there and you started to speak about these things. Were you talking about things like if you take short breaths, you're, it actually will put you into kind of like a stressed out state? Was that part of some of the things? I know Tony Robbins talks about this a little bit, that if you start breathing differently, you could change, or Navy SEALs teach this too, right? you breathe differently in different situations and it can calm down your body even underneath the stressful situation. Tell me a little bit about what you were teaching because that was interesting to me about this breathing and psychological stuff along with the physical stuff. What are some of the beliefs that you have now that can help us out? Well, according to Wilhelm Reich, who was a student of Sigmund Freud, he recognized that his patients, uh, when they would speak of their various traumas, uh, rather than listening to them, 
he started watching them and he started to recognize certain physical movements and patterns in their breathing that would arise when they uh, when they would relive that trauma. And he began to categorize these particular movements, postures and breathing patterns into uh, to character structures. And each one of these character structures were linked to a, a form of a psychopathology. So you've got oral, you've got schizoid, masochist, psychopath, and, and so on. And so you look like your quote unquote psychopathology and none of us are free from psychopathology. All of us got, all of us are some, in some way, uh, either schizoid, oral, masochist, psychopath. And uh, it's, it's, it's helpful to know that because there are also personality traits that are linked with it, right? So for example- Can you, you define know, those real quick for the guys listening that don't know each one of those different traits? So if we work through, work through them beginning with schizoid, a schizoid character, typically the body will begin to look, will look thin. They usually have thin, they usually have very bigger eyes, more active mind. Uh, they tend to be more of a fear type. They're, they're more motivated by fear. Uh, a lot of their positive characteristics are creativity. They're usually like artists and scientists. Um, but the whole idea of, of being schizoid is to be separate from the body. So they would live, you know, generally in the head. So this, the schizoid tendency would be to overthink things, but not really be in touch with intuition, not really being in touch, being grounded in their body. The oral character is, and of course, each one of these, like I said, are formed by the experiences that we have coming up, you know, various uh, traumas. The schizoid is, is typically begins, that character structure begins forming in the womb, you know, a lot of times, and it's usually a byproduct of uh, the rejection by the mother. So oftentimes the mother is, may be schizoid herself. She may have, uh, she may have been addicted to drugs or alcohol. She may have had, um, you know, been in a very stressful relationship or in a, you know, wartime, things of this nature, where so there's a sense of, uh, of almost distance between the mother and the child, even in utero. The oral character structure, uh, the, body begin, the body is a little bit more formed, but takes sort of a rounding of the shoulders and a little bit more of a jutting, head, a jutting forward of the head, uh, almost like a baby reaching out for mom, right? So you think oral, that oral stage of development is associated with attachment through the mouth. This is during the breastfeeding phase. Uh, the traumas that are associated with the oral character are usually um, a lack of what the baby wants from the mother. So, you know, uh, letting the baby cry it out, um, the baby just not getting the nourishment that it needs or wants either psychologically, you know, emotionally really, uh, or, or nourishment or, you know, physical nourishment from the mother, the character, the oral character structure tends to be very friendly. They're usually very friendly. They're very, usually very talkative. Um, they're usually very, uh, indignant, meaning like they have a sense of entitlement because they didn't get what they wanted. And so they seem to latch on to people. They become very needy. Um, the, the masochist character structure is usually formed around potty training time and it has everything to do with autonomy. It, the trauma typically comes about when mother needs to go to work, but baby's still shitting himself. <laughs> so, uh, there's a lot of shame and guilt around bodily autonomy. Um, you need to poop now, or, you know, why didn't you, why didn't you poop when I wanted you to poop? Uh, it, and it's the entire alimentary canal. So also the mouth. Why aren't you eating what I want you to eat? Open your mouth. And, you know, so the the oral, the uh, masochist character structure start because there's a block here and here. The, the masochist character structure sort of starts building up. They're usually thicker, sometimes obese, just uh, more full bodies. Uh, the psychopath is uh, is a little bit older. A psychopath tends to have its trauma associated with betrayal. Um, oftentimes, say, the mother builds up the boy to be something that he can't be. 
often the father is not present. So it's one of these like son husband situations where you're going to grow up and be the good man that your dad, your dad never was. And that site, that kind of, um, that kind of pressure on the child starts to build up, but it can't be released. It's almost, you know, Wilhelm Reich would likened it onto a form of incest, like psychological incest. And so the psychopath character structure tends to have maybe like smaller hips because of the lack of the ability to release sexually because they're children, but the body builds up. So they almost have like a V shaped structure, usually very big up top, usually very extroverted, ha has a lot of energy in the face, has very charismatic. Um, they tend to be very good leaders, but they also tend to uh, be more angry uh, as opposed to the to the far end, of the other end of the spectrum with the psych with the um, with the schizoid who's more fear based. On this far end of the spectrum, uh, it's more anger based, and so I thought that was fascinating because you know I I started studying it and I and I had a bio uh, bioenergetic analyst that I was working with for many years. And I was learning a lot about myself. I was learning a lot about how to resolve these blocks. And so I started bringing it into my videos and bringing it into my training. And even just by listening to me right now, I'm sure some people are listening and they're like, wow, that's really weird stuff. And so people started calling, you know, calling me uh, pseudoscience and, you know, I'm trying to sound smarter than I am. I should just stick to lifting weights. And so <laughs> that kind of hurt my feelings. I bet, dude. It's like you have this identity as this strong man weightlifter, and then you're changing that identity to the audience a little bit where they're like, I know you for this. And so first off, congrats. Many people never take that next step, which I'm assuming would have made you feel dead inside, sticking with things that you knew weren't the real thing you wanted to talk about, rather than going into the things that you think would be super helpful for people, which wasn't easy at all. You had an identity. You could have just kept going the way you're going. So I appreciate you for stepping out of your comfort zone there. Now going into the men today, what do you see with this, with your message? I, I wanted to ask you around masculinity. I feel that when I ask, I never get the answers that I'm looking for. And it may be because I have a perceived idea of what I want people to say. Yeah. I'm like, oh, like I haven't really heard people give great definitions of what's masculinity from the past. What's the good things that you've taken from that? What do you see in masculinity today that's made you motivated to speak your message all the time? Where are people lacking? Like what's what's going on? What's the climate around masculinity right now inside of America or maybe a little bit abroad? But let's I want to kind of stick in America, North America area. Like what's what's going on with men? What do you see that's wrong or where do you think we should go? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, my exploration in this area began when I started looking into uh, so-called cultural Marxism. And it brought me back, I mean, it goes far back, but it brought me back to the Bolshevik revolution. I wanted to know what was happening to men in the West. And uh, you know, if you're familiar with the, the, the Russian revolution, the Bolsheviks, and how they were able to you know, overthrow the uh, leadership at the time and use aggression and force in order to unroll ultimately their goal, which was communism. Um, Antonio Gramsci and George Lucas were two Marxists who were heavily involved in the revolution, but they began to reckon, you know, of course, as with every movement, they want to spread, they want to, they want to grow it, they want it to, to take over the West. And so they realized that they weren't going to win over the West with bombs and bullets. They weren't going to do it with aggression. They weren't they wouldn't be able to do it with force. So Gramsci recognized that they needed to do, they needed to subvert the population they needed to have an ideological subversion and he he coined the term cultural marxism which was a means by which they would demoralize the culture destroy the the, the values and the principles and the religion mainly uh, of the people in the west in order to well change the culture so it would be so we would be more readily available to just simply take to accept socialism and communism rather than having it uh you know uh, enforced upon us gramsci uh gramsci noted specifically that in order to do that uh two things had to happen uh mainly he he stated that they needed to de-christianize the west and to de-christianize the west essentially means that you take out authority 
you remove the father, God the father, so you had to destroy religion. And they also knew that they had to destroy the family, so they had to take out the father in the home. And so when we start talking about the, well, you know, just to take a step back, he called he called the, the process by which they would do this the long march to the institutions so that they would ultimately uh, infiltrate the schools, the media, the church, the newspapers, the radio, like anything that they could, you know, government. You know, today we see the fruits of it because it worked. The long march of the institution has brought us the, the, the likes of, uh, what's his name, uh, Bernie Sanders, but he's just the extreme. We see it throughout. We see it with the entire uh, Democratic Party. In fact, the, the entire Democratic Party in the United States is has been ushered forward by this uh, the, what they call the socialist Democrats or uh, you know the socialist movement that started back in the fifties. But to but to bring it to where it makes uh, where it sort of answers the question for us: What has happened to men? Like Gramsci said, they had to destroy authority. But they also, but by doing so, they needed to do it in the home. They needed to, they needed to remove the father as the authority in the home, uh, and thus they bred contention between women and men. And this is where you get the birth of radical feminism. Uh, today, radical feminism is not about women voting; it's about chaos. It's about destroying the family. It's about destroying culture. It's about destroying the West. What was the purpose? When did this start? And like, what, you know, I always wonder what the motivation is. I had Tim Kennedy in here, right, on election day, actually. And we were talking about Nazism. And he had this show where they were tracking all these, where the Nazis relocated afterwards. And he actually had a whole thing where he went and infiltrated them. They were showing them all these Nazi things where they were keeping the Nazi dream alive. And one of my big things was always like, why? What do they, what do they want to do? Like, what's the, what's the purpose? Because all it's doing is, for the main population that I can see, and again, you're the expert. I'm I'm learning from you right now. I'm like, it's not really doing anything good for like the mass majority of people. Who's benefiting off of all of this, and what's the purpose of it? Did you watch Looney Tunes when you were a kid? I used yeah. to watch Looney Tunes, and it was a little skit with uh, two mice, uh, Pinky and the Brain. Remember Pinky and the Brain? Yeah, yeah. And Pinky was like the tall dummy that would follow along with the short, big brained uh, brain. And every episode, Pinky would ask him, oh, what are we going to do today? He said, T we're going to take over the world. And it's like this nefarious, almost uh, comical, but real desire for a certain certain groups of people uh, that want more and more and more and more power to where we are today, where there is a strong push. In the beginning, it was sort of hidden. But today it's a very overt and strong push to this new global governance, a new what they call a new world order. Uh, and we're I think we're really at the pinnacle peak of it since 2020 with, you know, everybody has fallen into line with the rituals of the new world, given that we all wear these masks. Uh, the vaccines are coming next. Really, they need the 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 the, the people to be. Uri, Yuri Bezmenov said that there were there were certain stages he said there was uh, for ideological subversion basically the complete brainwashing of a culture and we're like at he would say that there was um there was demoralization right where you demoralize the people ultimately like this whole sexual revolution which wilhelm reich was a big part of it was a part of demoralizing the culture. Getting rid of religion is demoralizing the culture. Getting rid of the father and destroying the, the home, demoralizing the culture. Then the people would be ready for a crisis. So once you're demoralized, you then create a crisis. And then once there's a crisis, because the people are so demoralized and they have no values and they don't know, they don't have any true, real authority, they're just willing to go along with their new savior, i.e. the government. So we have COVID crisis, and then we have the you know the savior government with their you know their regulations and they're shutting down the government, uh, shutting down the the businesses and the vaccines and stuff. So there's a crisis that then makes the people the the weak demoralized people say, "Save us, save us, do something." Um, and then once the the people who usually create the crisis then save you from the crisis, uh, the final stage is called normalization. 
And normalization is where like, you know, a year later, even though it was two weeks to flatten the curve, we got people walking around with masks and we got gov we got government shutting down businesses and we find ourselves in the predicament that we're in right now. So it almost seems like like this is the icing on the cake. Like we're there. Yeah, that's why when I, I remember someone saying something that Donald Trump is kind of a representation of a lot of people as this strong male figure. And a lot of times they were hurt from that same exact style personality type in the past. So they, they it's almost like their daddy issues come out when they see President Trump. And it's interesting because what you're talking about 10 years ago when you were starting on YouTube, it just didn't feel the same. I, I remember the first time I went to a cafe, I'm from San Diego, and I always said, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. It just became a habit that I just started on my own. It just felt really respectful. And I remember the first time that I said, yes, ma'am, over and over again, and thought, I hope that I'm not offending the person that I'm talking to because I don't know if they want to be called that. Right. And it was interesting because I don't want to just be a jerk to everyone, right? And just like, that, that's not the point of it. Yet I've seen even your content, you have your shovels and you have your guns and you have these things that can represent sometimes to them their definition of this toxic masculinity. Because there's obviously things I'm sure, I don't know what your family's like. But, you know, my dad back in the day, like the way that he got me to not do stuff is to threaten to throw me through a wall or to punch me in the face. And that was like masculinity. Right. And people think that that's like how masculinity is, is all this like negative stuff. And I'm sure that pops up when people are seeing, you know, with, with your gun. And obviously there's people that have to love it. Like me, I love it. I'm like, man, that's badass. Like yeah. this guy's doing stuff and it attracts me and it, and it repels. It, I think it's interesting. How have you seen it's changed over this last 10 years. Cause I remember that moment like 12, t like 10 years ago, nine years ago when I had that first thought. And then it's like, you know, I'm sitting there eating a, a nice steak and I'm like, man, I hope, uh, I hope I can ask my waiter like what their favorite thing on the menu is. Cause they may not even like that. We're even eating meat here at this place. I'm like, Oh my gosh. Like what's the, there, there's that weird balance. Comment on that. Uh, there's a lot of things I want to go into with it, but how have things changed over the last 10 years, do you feel? And what's made you keep speaking against it? Like, where are you taking men now compared to where they're going? Well, you know, it's interesting to say last 10 years and the timing is perfect. If you consider that, you know, the, the, the flower power children, the hippies of the 60s, uh, who are all about revolution, and, um, and revolution isn't necessarily a good thing. Progress isn't always necessarily a good thing. They went from being idealistic hippies to now being, you know, the Nancy Pelosi's and the Chuck Schumer's in Congress. Uh, and mainly, the most the most damning part is they're the university professors. They're the ones that are teaching the new youth. They're the ones that are teaching the new generation. Not only is it this, you know, this brainwashing that's coming from their, from their false ideology, but these children are demoralized because feminism has created a situation where they have basically been raised with the morals of the television. They've been raised by the more, with the morals of the, of the degenerate culture. Uh, most of them were daycare kids. And so they really have no familial uh, foundation uh, a lot of them were fatherless. I mean, that's a, that's really the if if I had to point to w the root of our issues and where most of the healing has to happen, uh, it is within the home, it's within the family, but mainly with the issue of fatherlessness. And you mentioned Donald Trump before, as you know, like the, as the dad that maybe a lot of people are afraid of. Well, there's two things that has that, that I see unfolding, and and I have to be vigilant against it. Um, Number one is that a lot of a lot of people, just a lot of young men, women, they've just never seen a strong man before, a good man, a righteous man, an authoritative man, an alpha male. They just don't know anything about it because they've never really met one because it's so rare today, given the situation. But number two, there's been an onslaught against men in the media. It, and it, it's been ramped up with social media. You saw it beginning in the television with the TV series and the sitcoms in the 80s and 90s with the bumbling buffoon father or, you know, the TV, the after school TV specials with the with the tyrant father. So you had either cowards or tyrants uh, generally being represent men being generally represented by either cowards or tyrants in the media. We also seen a swap of the gender roles in the media where, you know, generally speaking, men were doing men things like men are usually 
the ones that are going to do tough stuff like run into burning buildings and save people uh, and you know, have on the helmet and the gun and like and go and protect. Um, but now we're seeing like all the superheroes are women and the men are like they're the they're the sidekicks. And so this whole this this distancing from masculinity, this this removal of the father, plus the bombardment of this false ideal, this false ideal given through the media has confused everyone. And when you talk about the moral stuff, I feel that when they got these morals stripped away now, I'm looking at it from what you're talking about, that these guys now are getting their morals or their beliefs of what's right and wrong just based on their feelings and whatever logical thing they have. So everyone's got this whole different definition based on themselves, which not everyone's smart to build a moral foundation and figure out right or wrong. I have people that right. are on my Facebook news feed going, man, uh, Joe Biden, blah, blah, blah. I can't believe that. I, I'm one guy, he voted for Joe Biden. And he said, man, I'm really upset with how everything's going so far. And then uh, uh, other friends that I had chimed in and go, dude, he's barely been in leadership for just a little bit of time. How dare you try to blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, holy crap. Like everyone's looking at this, at these situations from what they think their morals are that they just made up what's right and wrong. And, and everyone's looking at it so differently. Uh, and I also see men and women are kind of becoming the same. When I go places, I, I follow a news station here and I apologize to them because I love their news station here in Austin, Texas. But when I watch their stories and stuff, I'm like the male news anchor and the woman like news anchor lady, they're like the same, right? It's like, Hey guys, we're doing our weather report today. Like, let's get this done. I'm like, you guys are like the same person. Like there isn't a very big difference between you as a man and, and her as a woman and the strengths coming out. It feels like society's kind of blended where the guys are pretty similar to the girls and the girls, a lot of times, the reason why I don't work with women is because I'm like, they're pretty freaking smart. They're going out there. They're getting theirs. They're out there like leading things. They're getting things done. I'm like, all oh, these women are doing it. And all these guys are just like, have no purpose anymore. Can you touch on those two things of, uh, the men and women becoming the same and that's what it kind of feels like. And also the morality thing of people just making up their morals and making up right and wrong just based on their feelings. Uh, I get interviewed on these shows all the time and guys are like, I don't even know how they get to these beliefs that they have today, but they're here. You touch on those two things. Yeah. I, that's called mommy mentality and where, you know, the world where women rule, we live in a matriarchy. There's no question about it, that it's the woman's mind. It's the woman's value. It's the woman's emotion that rules the roost. Uh, and if you don't have to look any further than the divorce courts to see that whatever the woman feels is what she's going to get. It has nothing to do with what's right. It has to do with how she feels. Um, there's a convergence of, of different goals to that they, right? The oligarchs, the rulers of this world, ultimately Satan wants to uh, achieve. Um, and it, one of them, pro, the most predominant, goes back to the destruction of the family and the way you just destroy the family of course you know i said first by taking the father out but then by depolarizing the sexuality and so uh by depolarizing sexuality by making women men and men women there's confusion in the family there's confusion in sexuality and then ultimately there is a right now we're at a point where they're telling us that there's uh too many people on the planet so we're overpopulated. And if you can convince the women that having children is oppressive uh, and that it's better to go work for a boss than to work for your family. Um, and of course, that you know, feminism has, has destroyed women in such a degree that they no longer value being feminine. There's nothing valuable about, about being feminine. If you ask a woman, you know, what women rights are, they're going to describe everything that is, is, is masculine. And it's like, yes, but what about the beauty that's only available through the feminine, our feminine counterpart that no longer holds any value? And what is as truly masculine in the man is seen as toxic. So now you've got confusion. You've got confusion, uh, uh, gender confusion, sexual confusion, even this, you know, the whole transgenderism and LGBT thing, Q, X, Y, Z, where it just keeps going and going. It's like I said, there's a few different things that are converging. Of course, chaos is one of them. Um, but the, uh, this is all, this is all designed to destroy the family. And then there are people who believe 
that it, it would be better if we didn't exist that where we have too much we're breathing too much we're farting too much we're eating too much we're too, the truth is we're too much of a but we become too much of a burden on their central bank system and we're the the where the economies are about to collapse because of welfare uh amongst other things you know that's just one part of it so uh i am of the opinion and i'm keeping my eye out and my finger on the pulse for this new movement towards depopulation and it and it's all wrapped up in this quote unquote green movement we got to save the planet by killing people we got to kill us off dude that's so wild it everything that you're saying is probably maybe shocking to some people, maybe something that they felt before and what you're saying about this green movement and the reducing population. I mean, many people out there think that they've been trying to do this for a really long time and the experiments on people to abortion, which is something that my wife's super passionate about to uh, maybe even vaccinations for some people. And I'll probably, you know, it's so interesting. There's this guy, what's his name? Crowder, last name Crowder. Have you heard this guy? Steve Crowder. Yep. You like him? I've uh, watched I, a couple of his videos. Um, I I know he's conservative. I know he speaks out. And I think he was recently banned, um, but I haven't really followed him much. Yeah, yeah. And and that was one of the things, too, is that now you have this threat of going against the grain in society and being this right. person. Like, Have you ever gone through some of that stuff where some of your content gets you in trouble or you get threatened to be banned or demonetized or deplatformed, all that stuff? Yeah, I was I was banned from TikTok. And it's so funny. Um, you know, I, I'm in a constant battle as well because I have three daughters and they're part of the culture. And so I have to always debrief them, I'm always having conversations with them. And yesterday was one of them. So, you know, um, I'm anti-feminism. I'm anti-feminism because of what its stated purpose by its founders were, which was just to destroy the family, liberate the woman from, <laughs> from being a woman, from being a, a mother, from being a wife under the idea that, that, that it's somehow oppressive. Um, so I got banned from TikTok for just voicing my opinion on that. But funny, yesterday, one of my daughters sent me a video of a woman explaining why it's appropriate to hate all men and essentially call, saying that all men are rapists. And I, of course, I had to debrief my daughter. I'm like, this is ridiculous. This doesn't make any sense. Look at me, your brother, your, your grandfather, your uncles. Who? What men? What men do you need to be afraid of because of this quote unquote uh, rape culture and that all men are evil but that because we live in a matriarchy that is upheld as something positive you got all these male feminists and you got you know women will clap and nobody will nobody will correct a woman that says something like that but me if i call that out toxic you gotta go even with men today i feel that when they when you look at the things that they say the things that they do Many of them are consistently just gravitating more towards it's celebrated to be more feminine. I've never heard a guy or anything talk about being more masculine over the last five years. I don't really know anything besides maybe some stuff that's polarizing like yourself and your content and people in that stream. It's not really celebrated for a man to be more masculine. It's only celebrated for them to tap into feminine and masculine energies and all these things. Right. What's your opinion of these feminine and masculine energy balances. There's many guys in our group that talked about this and some of them are like, I don't need any of this feminine energy. I'm just trying to be masculine. And they believe in true masculinity. You can fully like be amazing. And then there's other guys that are like, yeah, like this is so wrong. This is the definition of toxic masculinity is the fact that you guys can't even first be self-aware enough to see that you need this feminine. What's what are, where do you stand with this whole masculine feminine energy and the balance of that in a, male today well for really quickly just to point out that it's about diabolical disorientation confusing the people because as you as they denigrate masculine values and virtue in a man it's held up and, and not only held up promoted pushed on women right so you see that it's not it's not against masculinity and it's really about compliance and disorientation it's about confusion it's about chaos because everybody knows that masculine virtue is what builds all societies Every, you look out the window everything that's built out there men created men created everything women have the creative instinct in order to do what they 
only they can do. Just like men have their outward creative instinct, women have the inward creative instinct. Women create babies. To be a mother is the essence of femininity. A woman finds her value in relationships. She finds her value in family. She finds her value in, in having and, ra and raising children. But you can't say that. So not, not only is there an attack on masculinity in men, there's an attack on femininity in women. And so, and, but it's, it's not just a, it's a swap. Men, you need to be more like women. Women need to be more like men. And so we've, a lot of us, I mean, myself included, until I, I woke up to this reality, we've swallowed this pill without question because of the demoralization of our culture. It's been, it's been, it's been coming on for, you know, the past 60 years or so. Now, when you're talking to a man who is, is, is in confusion with that, who's having a hard time with that, um, the first thing you got to do is you got to, what we have to do is we have to look with compassion on the, on the, on the core wound, which nine times out of 10 is fatherlessness. You, for a man to embrace femininity means that he's got the, in that way, has he, it means he has more of a mind of his mother than he actually does of a father. Because, uh, you know, in the mommy culture where mommy rules, the mommy's values reign supreme, even in a little boy's mind as he's growing up and becoming a man, which does not serve a man. Our ancestors understood that at the time a boy becomes about 12, 13 years old, when testosterone starts raising in his body, when he goes from being a boy to a man, cross-culturally, uh, anthropologists like Mercer Eliade discovered that there was always a pattern of movement away from the world of the mother and atonement with the world of the father. And this was critical for the young man to be of any value to the society. Otherwise, he would be, uh, you know, like what many men are today, virtually useless as a man. Um, that that movement was, or that, um, that rights, or that initiation included a movement away from all things that were pleasurable, because the world of the mother is the world of material. I like to think that the word mother is synonymous with matter, you know, matriarch, matter, uh, material, the matrix even, you know, the, the things that blind us that we that we think are there but really aren't emotions, you know, things of that nature. Um, but we stay trapped in it. It first of all, it's it's not facility, there's no facilitation for it to be transcended, but then we get trapped in it because the world pleasure the world promotes pleasure. Life is all about. What can I get? How do I feel? Playing video games, masturbating to porn, uh, eating junk food. It's all about me feeling comfortable, me feeling pleasure. Um, even religion has gone to the point where it's if, 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 a, if a religion isn't pleasurable for you, if it's not giving you ecstasy, uh, it's almost like, well, that's not a fun religion, right? Like Christianity is a religion about sacrifice and suffering. Uh, Christianity has, has declined tremendously in the West because it's not a pleasurable faith. It's not about, you know, of course, there's the feel good gospel, but it's not about feeling good. The churches that you mentioned being feminized, it, it you know, there's women, of course, you know, they're, 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 that play their role in that. But a lot of it has to do with weak men, effeminate men being attached to pleasure. Um, once that once that clean break with the world of the mother, meaning the world of pleasure and comfort, is established, there was always, which is always accompanied by a form of austerity, a form of challenge, you know, like fasting, or they would have a rites of passage that would require them to, you know, maybe kill an animal or to scale a mountain. My brother was involved in a Native American uh, rites of passage, Sundance. And they put it, they took him up to the top of a mountain, drew a circle around a rock and said, sit there. And he had to sit there for four days, cooking in the sun, no food, no water. I mean, it was, it was arduous. And that was just the beginning. Once that process, once that breakdown of the baby boy ego has occurred through this type of austerity, that's when the fathers, the grandfathers, the uncles, the elders, the older men, the men that have been the leaders of the society would then begin instilling values into the boy. And what this tells us is that becoming a man is not arbitrary. You know, a lot of people will denigrate me and they'll say, oh, you should just know how to be a man. But our ancestors were smarter than that. They knew that you can't just be a man. You know, Not like a woman who nature gives them their period, right? That's it. Boom. That's the end of childhood. Now you're on to the next thing. 
for a man, it w the only way for a man to become a man is through other men. And we don't, we simply just don't have that. We don't have that. We don't have that initiation process. We don't have the, any type of impetus to move away from pleasure. Uh, and we damn sure don't have elders. We don't have older fathers. We don't have grandfathers. And without that, <clears throat> we don't have meaning in our lives. And so this is where we are. Well said, man. And even thinking about your friend or brother, whoever it was that was with the Native American and was sitting there in the circle for four days, people would think, man, that's so cruel. That's so hard. And at the end of the day, that's what's preparing him for things that are way harder. Right. It's like a controlled environment of hard so that you go out there and, and actually do things that are actually hard when they come up and you're prepared for them. But in this society, people don't really have to do much of anything. They don't have to go out there and hunt anymore and do these things. So let's say for the guys, just closing thought, let's say they're like, okay, I want to not focus on how can we change masculinity for the whole world. But if it was just me trying to be the best me, wanting to go out there and refine myself, what are the things that men can do leaving here? What book could they read? What activities could they do? Do they lift a thousand pound stone, like pull a freaking truck? I don't care what it is. What's like some things that they could do to, to unlock some of those core principles and start walking their life as best as possible as a male in 2021? Well, I think we're already beginning to see the pendulum swing. And that and this is always the case. It's just human nature that when we go too far in one direction, there will be a there will be a reversal. And we're starting to see young men, you know, millennials that are doing things like dopamine detoxes because they've realized that they've just been way too comfortable, way too unindated, way too pampered with all the technology, with all the food, with all of the pornography, with all of the girls, with all of the pleasure. And so anytime that you can pull yourself away from these uh, these attachments and mortify the flesh, you're becoming a little bit strong. You're becoming more of a man. To be a man is to suffer. This is this is this is the message of Christ on the cross. This is the message of our ancestors to all men. To be a man is to sacrifice. To be a man is to suffer. And if you can't sacrifice your iPhone for 48 hours, if you can't sacrifice food for three days, if you can't sacrifice looking at porn for a day, well, then you're, you're going to be trapped in the mommy mindset for the rest of your life. So find different ways that you can impose austerity on yourself. Challenge yourself. No one's going to take you up to the mountain until you sit on a rock for four days, but nobody's stopping you from doing it yourself. It's, it's tough because we're doing it by ourselves, meaning that there's no liminal space. There are no other men, there are no other people there to, to support you in that, which I think will ultimately change because I think there's a calling for this and this is a part of my mission. But once that's done and that and that slate has been cleaned, uh, there's a there's a there's a passage in the gospel where Christ says something to the effect of this. He 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 uh, exercises. He kicks out the demon from someone. Someone's you know they're they're suffering. They're they're under this demonic oppression, and he rids them of the demon. And then he tells his students. He says, "Look, this is not the end of the story." Once you he uses this metaphor, he says, once you once you sweep out the house, once you clean out the house, if you don't fill it back up with the right stuff, that demon's gonna come back with seven of his friends, and they're gonna they're gonna be like, oh, there's a clean house here, nobody's living here, and he's, they're gonna take over again. So it's not good enough to you know clean your house in that way using that metaphor. Uh, the dopamine detoxes, the austerity, the fasting—they're great, they're cool, they clean your slate, but you need a new imprint, and this is where religion came. This is where mythology came. This is where stories came. This is where meaning and purpose came. This is the purpose. This is the reason for those things. And it is of great value to enroll in or adopt or explore your faith. That way you have a sense of meaning. There's purpose. You're no longer just a, a, a meat suit walking around, shitting and eating. You are a divine being. You're a son of God. And you can carry that back into the world with you with some sort of dignity. That's awesome, man. I appreciate you sharing that. And for the guys that are maybe listening and want to check out more of what you're doing or even say, man, this landing for me, obviously they can message you the word king. They got to check that out. And so consistent every single day, Instagram stories. I'm like, I got this down, dude. Um, they can do that. What, is there another way that it would be best to connect with you or is that the best way? 
I've been fairly active on YouTube on my Elliot Hulse channel the past couple months. So I put up videos talking to these things if, you, if they interest you. And then, of course, you can follow me on Instagram. And uh, those are the two places where you'll, you'll probably find most of my rants. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much again for coming on the BDB podcast and sowing into the men that we have here to reap a big harvest of, of men that are rising up, being great fathers, being not just present or there for their kids, but actually present with their kids. And I know it's been an impact on me without people going out there and doing it first. I wouldn't have known. I have a great mentor that would always tuck his kids in at night and always say goodnight, even when he's traveling to the point where he legitimately hitchhiked across the whole United States, got there in the morning because he told his daughters that he would have breakfast with them. And that to me was an example of, oh, that's how you're, that's how you're a father. Like you set the boundaries, you follow through on your word and do whatever it takes. And, and that impacted me. So for everyone listening and yourself included, man, like, Thank you for setting the example because that's what makes the impact on people, showing them not just through talk, but through action, how to rise up as a man, how to be a great father so that we can curse them. This I've heard 80% fatherless homes in some cities in America. It's absolutely insanity. And I appreciate you for being a great voice and helping these men rise up. Well, thank you for having me. Awesome, man. Thanks again.